Okay. Well, we're down to the the few hardcore here. Um, what do you want to talk about? Final projects. Uh, I can talk about. I2C, that was one of the requested topics. I could talk about uh, any of the peripherals. So, final project questions, yes? Oh, um, I guess this is a request. So, you mentioned maybe talking about signal processing. I can talk a little bit, yeah, sure, I'll talk a little bit about signal processing. By the way, one of the students, you want to tell your experience yesterday with uh, sampling? Oh yeah, we, we got $70 worth of parts for free because we just emailed them. So you, if you get donation of parts from vendors, you do not have to budget them. So for the cost of an email, you got 70 bucks worth of parts. Not bad. Uh, some companies are routinely will send stuff maxim-ic.com, Maxim Integrated Circuits, will typically send you three of anything by DHL for delivery within two days. For merely asking. Op amps, uh, uh, voltage references, a bunch of analog stuff. <clears throat> typically the big Distributors like Adafruit won't do that. You have to go to the manufacturer. And what you are going to want to do is to say something like, Hi, we're, we're Cornell students working on a budget. We have to, we have to do a project and we're going to build a web page and we would be happy to advertise your stuff if you sponsor us. And we'll put it on our web page and we'll put it on the, we'll talk about it in the video we have to make for the course. And by the way, the video channel for this course has gotten uh, almost 5 million views. So you can shamelessly talk yourself up and uh, convince them. Don't lie. Don't say we're going to build a million of these. If only we have your parts, but, but, uh, but talk up the reality as much as you can. Use Cornell's name shamelessly. We've had in the past people, uh, let's see, you got pressure for force sensors, right? We've had people get flex sensors by the, by the tens for free. Uh, the, probably the biggest score was a uh, students called a German company because they wanted a sulfur uh, uh, hydrogen sulfide detector for making a fart intensity meter. <laughs> Serious problem that well solved, right? And so this was a two hundred plus dollar part. This guy, the, the engineer they talked to at whatever company this was in Germany happened to be from MIT. He, they managed to make him laugh with the concept. He said, I'll just drop one in an envelope and send it to you. They had one. You want to make sure you hook it up right. They did, it worked. It was very sensitive. It could get hydrogen sulfide in your breath. <sighs> you go like this and it would, it, would, it would give you a concentration of hydrogen sulfide. That's very impressive. So it never hurts to ask. Never hurts to ask if somebody will give you something. They might well. Might be the end of the year for their advertising budget. Might be that they have a few laying on their desk. I, I called up a piezo company once, piezo uh, a speaker company told them I was trying to I was trying to simulate <laughs> this almost sounds ridiculous uh, so some spiders communicate by drumming their abdomen on leaves 
boom, 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 okay? It's a private channel. The leaf, does, it, the sound is rather low frequency. It doesn't go off the leaf, and so predators can't hear it. But other spiders on the same leaf can hear it. And what we wanted to do was to build a device which would simulate a 7 milligram abdomen whomping on a leaf. Oh my god. So we ended up uh, using a, a but no, can any of you define what a tone arm is? A tone arm is the device that swings out over a record to play the record. Now can any of you define what a record is? Anyways, it's a counter, it's a counterweighted beam, and I asked him if I could get a piezo that I could put on the end of this beam and, 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 and simulate spider abdomens. And the, the guy thought that was so totally bizarre, he gave me, just cleaned off his desk with everything he had and sent it to me. And one of them happened to work. Don't hesitate to call people. Calling is better than emailing. Also, remember that if you are, if you have a valid collaboration with another group, where va valid means that I've approved it and another, and a PI has approved it, then there is no budget. You can spend whatever you want whatever the PI says you can spend. That has to be pre-approved. So, any other questions about final projects? First, first progress report is due Tuesday. We're now one week into final projects, or almost a week into Tuesday's final projects. No rest. Any questions? All right, let's, I could, I could talk a little bit about signal processing. If you can scroll down on this list on the page, there's a few applications. One is NTSC video generation, which is endlessly entertaining, uh, but NTSC is now an obsolete standard since it's no longer used for broadcast in the United States. It is, however, used for closed circuit television. So, for instance, the backup monitors on an automobile are typically NTSC monitors or sometimes now digital monitors, but the retrofit ones are all NTSC. NTSC is an acronym that is a color encoding system <coughs> using 1930s signal compression to get the color onto the uh, video channel. Some neural modeling, but let's look at digital pro signal processing. Basically, digital signal processing is an exercise in which you take some sort of analysis scheme, often derived from differential equation modeling of analog filters, but not necessarily, or perhaps uh, modeling based for, uh, on, on FFT, and you use those methods to extract some kind of information from a signal or to generate a signal or some combination of those. I, I did a project over the summer where I was trying for high accuracy generating a sine wave using the DAC low pass filtering it very very gently with a 300 ohm resistor and a, and a 10 nanofarad capacitor to get rid of the steps in the direct digital synthesis waveform and then feeding that through a device under test in this case an RC circuit then putting the signal back into the analog to digital converter and also putting the input signal into the analog digital converter so I could measure the phase shift and amplitude of this complex impedance. In other words, you make an impedance meter. And the output of an impedance meter is Bode plots or could be and the the 
it took an astonishing amount of work to get the accuracy within one degree of phase shift at the cutoff frequency. It was weeks of work fiddling around with it because there are a bunch of error mechanisms that you don't know about until you try and do it. But this would be an interesting thing. Wouldn't it be fun as a final project, you take a component or a set of components, linear components, you make a two, two lead device out of it. So, you know, something that looks like like this with an inductor and a resistor and you hook it across the, the, the microcontroller and it gives you the complex impedance. That'd be fun. That'd be a good, a good project. And really it's about precision of understanding how the analog works and also doing very large averages. I, I found out um, if, you, if you want one degree accuracy at 10 kilohertz, you need to average together about 100,000 waveforms. So, Well, let's go down and talk a little bit more about simpler stuff here. I, I like spectrum analysis. It, it's, it's entertaining. Do I just wrote a, 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 a system that uses the TFT and embedded in this, which some of you may find useful, is an FFT. So this is a fixed point FFT. Fast Fourier transform runs in about for for 512 points runs in about uh, 140,000 cycles, so I'll call it two milliseconds or so, three milliseconds, and so the system is there's the the butterfly operations there, so the. Uh, um, you can expect to do audio rate FFT in real time. So you can expect to do a spectral analysis of a, of a speech signal to get out a F versus amplitude versus time versus time for a for a speech signal and speech is not stationary, as you probably know. Otherwise, I'd be standing here going e. So speech is not stationary. So you could expect that the power spectrum is going to vary fairly rapidly as a function of time. How rapidly? Probably not more rapidly than one speech cycle, which is about 100 hertz. So you'd figure you'd take a spectrum every 10 milliseconds. If it takes two milliseconds to actually extract the spectrum and you need one every 10 milliseconds, it's real time. However, getting a linear frequency spectrum is not the way your <laughs> hearing system works and is therefore not a good way of analyzing sounds if you want to make a recognition system or a system that behaves more or less like your hearing. Your hearing has better discrimination at low frequencies, so the hearing discrimination goes more like log f some, times some constant, but not exactly. In fact, people who, have, who study hearing have done a lot of work on what humans actually hear, called uh, <coughs> uh, you know, biophysics or, or uh, psychophysics, and the optimum frequency analysis system for human hearing would be something called a MEL transform, M-E-L. It is, you can, you can treat it as a weighted FFT, a weighted fast Fourier transform, where bins of the tra Fourier transform are grouped together of different widths depending on which frequency, or you can just write second order filters. You could just write about 
15 second order filters, which you could do in real time on this processor. It's what I did here. And you can analyze a sequencer and a synthesizer. I'm going to ask you to build a So this is producing a power spectrum of, uh, of my speech versus time in mel units. And you can see that there's a pattern of, of uh, vocalization here. And in fact, you can be trained to look only at the spectrum and understand what I'm saying. Reasonable sounding kind of musical kind of sound, things that sound like string. Based upon about 15 filters between 15 and 30 filters. You can also take these 15 or 30 filters and you can put them back together again to, to sound kind of like speech. So let's say that you, you have a, a filter distribution. looks like this so at low frequencies they're fairly they're fairly evenly spaced and then at higher frequencies they, frequencies they become log distributed and this is more or less a mel distribution if you then if you build a second order filter around each one of these frequencies so that they overlap about 50 percent or so you extract the energy in each one every 16 or 20 milliseconds or so, which is about as fast as your vocal cords can change shape. Then you get a 16 numbers or 15 numbers in 16 milliseconds. That's about a sample per one sample per millisecond, which pretty well defines the speech. And if you then resynthesize that, Let's see if I can try not to blow your eardrums out here. Let's see if I've got so 15 filter channels resynthesized. And when I'm resynthesizing, I'm not putting the full power distribution back in. I'm putting pure sine waves back in with a power proportional to the output from the filter. And it sounds kind of interesting. Oh, stop it. Thank you. Yes. Slightly odd, eh? I have no idea if I should agree to that or not. So if we go to 30 channels, It has an odd sound. It's understandable, but it, it sounds like some, some musical instruments or something simulating human voice. It's really odd. It turns out that if you, instead of using fixed frequency bands, if you track the loudest sine waves in your voice and only use the five loudest sine waves, loudest frequencies, you can resynthesize understandable voice. Nobody actually knows why this works. So there's some examples here of speech compression and playback. FM sound synthesis. Uh, this uh, is a uh, an attempt to make things that are slightly musically uh, in interesting. So really what you have here is a pair of a pair of <coughs> compute units one of which generates a frequency which is proportional to a main frequency that is being modulated by the sine of another frequency so it's FM modulated at some rate and if you do that, 
This was done as, as early as the 60s in, synthes in analog synthesizers. You can make kind of interesting sounds. Oh, except it won't open a WMA because it's a Windows thing, I guess. Let's try it. Let's see if there was another option there. Nope. All right, never mind. Anyways, you can make... Um, Fairly nice sounding, moderately musical uh, tones that sound kind of string-like, kind of bell-like. You can add energy as a function of time and make it sound like a, like a horn or a bowed string where the energy builds up exponentially. And I've got, I've got code that will do all that. <clears throat> There's also another technique for, for building musical instruments, uh, which I haven't implemented on this, on this architecture yet, but some other students have. Last year, uh, a glove piano. And what this is using is what's called physical synthesis, where you simulate the physics of each string separately. So you solve the linear wave equation on each string, in this case 30 strings, because they had three strings for each finger. And that sounds like a horrible amount of work, but it's not. Because if you'll remember way back to physics 2, one of the solutions of the wave equation is a traveling wave. Linear wave equation is a traveling wave. Where if you start a pulse on a, on a string, it propagates without loss of shape on a lossless linear string. And since it propagates without loss, you can model it as a shift register, which is extremely cheap to compute. <clears throat> and makes really good sound. This, this des design was invented by a guy named Carpless and another guy named Strong uh, at Cornell in the 80s. And is quite good at making nice sounding. Oh, uh, people have, at Stanford have, have made Every, every string instrument you can imagine, synthesized, pianos are quite hard. Uh, they've <coughs> designed a number of wind instruments. Uh, they've done 3D modeling instead of 1D modeling to make Tibetan singing bowls and, and various other interesting things. Uh, but um, it's all based on the idea that if you solve the wave equation sufficiently accurately, you get out a sound that sounds like the object that you're modeling. So,
So it is perfectly feasible to, in, in, a, in, a, in a DSP sense, to do between 60 and 100 poles of linear filters. So you could, effect, you could effectively do 30 two-pole filters. You could expect to do a two or three big FIR filters, finite impulse response filters. Why might you do that? Well, if you want to simulate the effect your head has on sound, when you hear something, you know which direction it's coming from. How do you know which direction it's coming from? The first cue is there's a propagation time across your head. If the sound is coming from the left, it hits your left ear about 200 microseconds before it hits your right ear, depending on the size of your head, maybe 300 microseconds or so. so the first cue is sound delay, it's time delay, but also you, each ear is an interferometer and, you're the, and you have a certain amount of hair that acts as an absorber and shoulders which are directional. So you, by, by co combining the impulse response of all of these things, your auditory system learns to localize sound. So if you get a haircut, you don't hear stuff in the right direction for a little while. <clears throat> then you relearn it. So if you take those impulse responses of your ear and play them and, and record them as FIR filters, an impulse response is really equivalent to an FIR filter, then you can simulate the shape of your head. Uh, one of the uh, I used to teach a biomedical engineering course and one of the most amazing projects I've seen there was a, a thing called a head related transfer function and the students actually measured the impulse response of their head by crazy gluing microphones into their ear canals. I, I see the look on your face and I agree. Ugh. But they had a, they used a cutoff earplug, so it wasn't directly to the to the flesh, right? It was on an earplug they stuck in their ears. Then they took a a loudspeaker and put it in front of the person, to the side of the person, over their head, about 150 different locations, and they built up a map of the impulse response of their head as a function of location. <clears throat> then they took that and played it back through a microcontroller in real time, so that you could simulate the motion of something around you even though it was from a monophonic source, you could simulate the position in space. It was creepy good. It was amazingly good. It sounded like somebody was walking up and whispering in your ear. Good. I believe that's doable on the PIC-32. That was a fun course to teach. So, if you want to do some DSP, rather than just reinventing the algorithm, come talk to me first. I might have already done some work on it and can save you some time. Doing first order low pass filtering is really easy. Doing filter banks is fairly straightforward. <coughs> because uh, I wrote a MATLAB program that, that designs pro, uh, uh, filters in C. So don't start from scratch unless you want to do something particularly weird. Any questions, more questions about final projects? What are you, what are you interested in? What do, you see yourself, what do you see as the hard part of what you're attempting to do? It's early yet, I know. It's only the first week. Questions will start coming up. I'll probably lecture for about one more week. And then after that, it's all going to be sitting in the lab answering questions. From now on, let's see, you have, you have a lab report due one week from now. After that, after that, there will be no assignments except for the final project. There will be no classes, 
Therefore, you are expected to be in lab 12 hours a week. That is your course load. That's sort of the minimum amount of time you're going to be spending in lab. Yes? What if you do work outside of lab? If you, oh, I mean, sure. I mean, in lab doesn't mean necessarily sitting in 238. It means spending 12 hours a week at a bench working on the project. Not thinking about it while drinking a beer in your dorm room, but actually sitting at the, at the bench working on this stuff. However, prudence says you should give me, you should at least pass in front of my eyes once a week. Because there's a general rule that says if your boss doesn't see you work, you're not working. If the final project works perfectly, you can get away with that. If it doesn't work perfectly, it's nice to have a backup that I knew you were actually doing something. I mean, obviously, the TAs uh, have, a, have a different view of you than I do, and we take that into account. We talk to everybody. We're assigning grades. This project, didn't, this project was great. Oh, but one person never showed up. Huh. So. We, uh, we can take into account uh, a lot of behavioral information because we see you a lot. Any other questions? Let's get out of here and go to lab. <laughs>